to worship Thee. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. Begin reading in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as, some of, as were some of them as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. In 1995, <clears throat> the Nazarene Church at Bradleyville had somehow come up with an opportunity to go to the Appalachian Mountains under the auspices of the Appalachian Service Project, ASP. And we were not attending there, but one of the people that was scheduled to go on that trip couldn't, and so second fiddle, I got asked, and I went. And we went to Jellicoe, Tennessee, and did work on... Uh, just call it what it was, an old hillbilly's house. Did some construction work for this Appalachia service project. And one of the nights we were there, they had devotions every evening as, as the, it was a work and witness trip. And it was a bunch of different, uh, they might have had 15 or 20 projects going at the same time. And over the course of the summer, each week was a different group. It was quite an organized event. But they had... They had their, their counselors, their staff, they had devotions, and, and they chose these first four verses for their devotions one night about how all baptized and all ate and all drank, and that rock was Christ. And they, the leaders that night that, that did, the, that did the, the class, they made it feel like a, a kumbaya, just a, it was warm and it was fuzzy and, and it was out of context, I felt like, and and so now for 26 years, when I read this passage, I think of that day, and honestly, I'm annoyed that they didn't finish it. They just left it all warm and fuzzy, and, and they missed the whole points that were following in the rest of this passage. As I sought for guidance for this week's service, I began to meditate on this, this and realized again that we have a common heritage as Christians. We get caught up in our conservative holiness aspect and, and we have our royalty. You know, you go to IHC and there's, there's the IHC royalty, the conservative royalty, and they've got the last name and they've got their own section. If you belong to this family, you can sit here. The names, we know that there will be people who will be asked to sing. You don't know what service, but because of who they are and, and we look up to them, they will be on that platform singing. At camp meeting, we go and we know that the good preachers are preaching in the evening. The best one will be on Friday night, and the rest of us fill in mornings and naps. I mean afternoons. 
So while that's the reality of the politicized church world we live in, it's not the reality with God. No, in verses 1 through 4, we realize that everyone is equal in God's eyes. Let me interject here. For the record, some people are better orators than others. There are some I enjoy listening to. I enjoy the night services more than the nap services. So I'm not being, it's fact. But how you use what you have is what God is, is counting on, is looking at the measure we're going to be judged. So if we were to reread, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through and all baptized and all ate and all drank. Everyone of the children of Israel started out the same. They had the same experiences. They all started out the same in God's eyes. And even today, every Christian starts out the same. Born again, having confessed their sins to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're Bible holiness or Bible Methodist or Bible missionary or Bible Baptist or Bible Catholic. Every Christian starts out at Calvary if they're going to be a Christian. This week we had, was Ellie's... Uh, the wrap-up of Riverview School, and we went to graduation Thursday night, and they had three seniors, and, and one of the ways that school does is all the seniors give a speech. Some are brutal. This year they were all decent. But they all give a speech, and, and so they all kind of gave their personal testimony during, during their speech, but then the commencement address, their, their motto had been only Jesus, and he, he brought each of them up to delve deeper into their testimony. But one of them is Kyle Evers, and he gave his testimony Thursday night at Riverview. They are a Baptist church school. And he told about how he was saved at four years old. Recognize I've sinned, I've done wrong, I need forgiveness. He was saved at four. Then he said, a few years later, I realized there's something more. And he said, I fully surrendered my life to God. I gave all of me to him, totally yielded. When I got home, I told Heidi, I said, that sounds a lot like second work to me. So I called his Uncle Jim last night, and you'll remember Jim was here at RIH IHC. And Jim's grandma and grandpa would be Kyle's great-grandma and grandpa. Kyle is Jim's nephew. They were Allegheny Wesleyans. I mean, he comes from some good stock. And Jim said Kyle is the most fully surrendered kid he's been around. He said he prays about everything. He has, he said, whatever decision he's going to make, he prays about, including, and he gave me the example of where to work. Kyle works at Sonic. If you go to Sonic in Forsyth, he'll come roller skating out and give you your food. So Kyle had several job opportunities. He's a great worker. He's always working. Um, but he prayed, and he felt like the Lord would have him work at Sonic. Jim, Jim was telling me this last night. He said, at Sonic, he met a boy named Philip. What's Philip's last name? Graduated last year. Lock, M Milfin, Mil Mifflin? Anyway, Philip. Philip was homeschooled and home churched. They didn't go to church. They, were, they believed in God, but they didn't go to church. They were home churched. They um, homeschooled. But Kyle befriended Philip. Philip's a year or two older than Kyle. And through their friendship, Kyle take him to work and pick him up and bring him home for whatever reason. And they got talking about the school. And, and Philip ended up coming to Riverview School, is now in Bible college in, to be minist in ministry, a ministry major. And Jim told me that today, this day, he's meeting with the deacon board at his church whether Philip should come back and do his internship there. A, a young man who at 10 or 12 years old, Jim said, realized there's more than just being forgiven. I can go deeper. I can be fully surrendered. 
Now through his job, a young man is in Bible college and is coming back to preach the gospel because the boy got surrendered. If, he, if Kyle would give his testimony in any of our churches this morning, he may be a Baptist, but we would all amen him. We all start out the same. All means all. Verse 5 starts with, but, but. Now we know trouble is coming. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They all started out the same. They didn't end the same. And it's still the case today. We start the same at the cross, but we don't all end the same. By morning, there will probably be people in hell who are learning today that once you're saved, you're always saved. Trusting in a, a proclamation that's not based on the entirety of Scripture. Today, there's people that are paying a priest to hear their confessions, and, and he's praying to one besides God the Father, and they're trusting in their father that's never been married and wears a dress like mama anyway to make it possible for them to enter heaven. Some groups are telling their young people, if you'll look right, we'll call you right, and it'll be all right. And that's wrong. And some in our circles today tend to equate that being sanctified will keep you above temptation without the ability to sin. That's almost a once in grace heresy. Again, that's a false narrative. Sanctification is a matter of the will, the white flag surrender of our heart, and then in turn being filled with the Holy Spirit. So the world is pert near drowning in false doctrine this morning and fleshly man-made ideas that send men to eternal damnation because, like verse 5 says, God is not well pleased. All Christians start out the same. How they end up is another story. Did they mind God? Did they walk in the light they had? Did they sin willfully? In essence, is God well pleased? Is he? You know, we often talk around here how his mercy endureth forever. And, and here's another for instance. He didn't leave us wondering what he was talking about because in verse 6 he said, Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. God through his word and its historical accounting gives us a basis of what not to do. Don't lust after evil things. The children of Israel had left Egypt heading for the promise. The way was hard, the food was scarce, and they complained. They wanted the leeks and cucumbers from Egypt. They wanted an easy way. They wanted a flashy way. They didn't want that old manna. They wanted quails. Something new and something exciting and something different. Other than what God was providing. They wanted their own way. They didn't want to have to go to the promised land and, and fight the giants. They, they wanted their own way. And so they cowered in fear and they lacked faith. And later on we'd read that they wanted a king to rule over them so they could be like the other nations and be all cool and, and just like everybody else and fit in. They wanted gold and they wanted girls. And if you read in the book of Numbers, it'll tell you of their sordid deeds. They lusted. They wanted evil things. And it didn't end well. And so this morning, we'd throw out the question, what is it that we want? Are we lusting after evil things? Now in verse 7, it says, Neither be ye idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You mean there's more besides don't, don't long for forbidden things now we can't be idolaters worship other gods but you see it's not just that don't put anything in front of God they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play I'm sure this morning if we knew it would be spooky how many Christians are on the lake or at the ballpark or the golf course or working or maybe just relaxing because they're kind of tired. Several years ago, I was talking to a guy, and he was telling me that at their church, he felt like people weren't giving prayer requests right, that they weren't, they weren't burdened one for another. They weren't, they weren't desiring. And, and like I would, see, I would see Johnny, and I know he, he had taken a fall on his face, and so his nose was skinned up, and I'd say, we need to pray for Johnny. And then I would see another need, and I'd, and he said the church wasn't, they weren't lifting each other up like they ought to. So he said I kind of, he was Sunday school superintendent or lead deacon at that church. And he said I kind of, 
I kind of exhorted them. I chastised them. We need to pray for each other. He said, now the next Sunday was deer season. He said the first day, and I, I wasn't there. I was deer hunting. But he said, man, you lost me. Right here, you lost me. See? He put something ahead of God. Playing instead of praying. That church, we like to point our bony finger, and say they'd rather feast and play as fast and pray. All Christians start the same. They don't end the same. So what do we look like today? Is Christ pleased? Is he well pleased with what we're putting preeminence on? First place, verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Don't long for forbidden things. Don't put things ahead of God. And now, don't commit sexual sins. Paul is writing to Christians. We read in verse 1, he said, Moreover, brethren. And this, I'll be honest, I had to dwell on this a while and pray about it because it seems an awful strange thing to put in a Bible to a church. Now specifically, this was to the church at Corinth, but to us generally. And history tells us, I was looking last night a little bit about Corinth, that it, was, it had a temple of Aphrodite, it had a thousand or more temple prostitutes, and it was known for its pervasive debauchery. And by giving the number of the people who perished, we could go to Numbers chapter 25 and read the account of what Paul is referencing. So they're living in a town that's known for perversion. Paul references a sin that's recorded in Numbers 25, and the sin was blatant, and it was flaunted, and it was dealt with. So what is the lesson for us today? We've got little people and old people. We know what fornication is. It's sex outside of marriage, and it's sin. Jesus took it one step further, though. He said to look with lust was equal to adultery, being performed as far as guilt and condemnation go. So it becomes a heart issue. Do we look too long? Do we dress in a way that we want to be looked at? Are we making ourselves sex symbols? Where is our heart? What is our will? Do we watch shows that make light of marriage and its union? I'll just tell it like it is. Several years ago, somebody had given us some Gilligan's Island DVDs. And Ginger is the redhead on the show, and she doesn't dress like she ought to. And I recognized that Ellie is watching this, and the sheer fact that I'm letting her watch this, I'm condoning this, be this attire. I threw them on the top of a cabinet, and I found them when we were moving, and they've been in the dumpster, and they're at the landfill. Several years ago, I spent a lot of time in hotels working uh, crop insurance in North Missouri, and you get bored in the evening, and there was a show on TV called The Bing Bang Theory. The setting is college. It's intellectual humor. And it, I saw the humor in it when I watched the show. And I don't even remember what, what happened or what, what the event was, except they were, they were flippantly dealing with the issue of sex. And the Lord convicted me big time of what I was watching. I haven't watched it since. That's been years ago. Are we watching stuff, reading stuff that makes light of that union? Our culture has become just as crass and just as vulgar as that of Corinth's. And the church today is bombarded with the temptations and the opportunity for wrong. The desire was put in us by God. It is good. But Satan has corrupted, cheapened, and convinced the world that his way is freer, funner, and more fulfilling. And unbelievably, the church is getting caught in his trap. 
I'll dress as I please. I'll look at what I want to look at. I'll watch what I want. I'll listen to the music I want to listen to. It won't take you very long on channel 59 on XM Radio, Willie's Roadhouse, to discover that a lot of secular songs are filled with debauchery. Conway Twitty ought to be ashamed of himself and some of the others. I turned off a song the other day and Ellie said, why'd you turn that off? And I said, if you could listen, if you heard the words, no, she was listening to it and I made her turn it off because I had heard it years ago and it was wrong. It's filthy. It's, it's, it's just, it's. Neither let us commit fornication. You see, we don't have, and I don't know why I'm going so much here, except like James Keaton said, Lord put his thumb in my back, so here we go. It's in the Bible, and we've gotten awful loose in our culture and in our circles, and what we listen to, and what we watch, and what we read, and what we allow. And God is not well pleased. And ruination and eternal loss is swiftly approaching if we don't deal with it. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of servants. Don't long for forbidden things. Don't put things ahead of God. Don't commit sexual sins. And now don't tempt God. Say, so what's that mean? James 1.13 says God doesn't tempt with evil, nor can he be tempted. Again, Paul is referencing the Exodus as recording in Numbers 21. So what was their tempting and trying? Verse Numbers 21, 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They spake. It was common, it was well known, and there was no hiding it. I suspect they even fed off of each other, trying to outdo the other with their words of disgust and disdain and distaste. They spake against God, there was no reverence. And they spake against his man, there was no respect. They spake against his uh, provision, there was no thankfulness. They continued, their continual careless talking then became a trial to God and they were punished for it. So I would ask us this question. What have you said this week that you shouldn't have? Oh, I'm guilty. I've had to apologize to Heidi and Ellie both and ask forgiveness of God. You see, our speech, is he well pleased? Is he well pleased? Verse 10, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. You mean besides everything else we can't do, we can't murmur? See, Jesus said in John 6, 43, murmur not among yourselves. And in Philippians 2, 14, it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. A murmur is an indistinct whispered or confidential complaint, a mutter. Several years ago, I've been chairman of the Taney County Sewer District now for I don't even know how long. And I was chairing that meeting and somebody was upset at us for something. I don't remember the details, except I remember him standing there and griping and carrying on and don't, not really throwing a fit, but trying to throw a fit. And as he turned to leave, he muttered under his breath. He murmured. And I heard him. I said, hey, what'd you say? Called him back to the podium. What'd you say? I said, no, you said something. What was it? Well, what he had said was, I'll see you in court. Well, I politely but firmly informed him that if he wanted to murmur, he could speak it out. Where everybody could hear it, not just me and him. And if he was threatening a lawsuit, then I had nothing else to say, and we had nothing else to say to him, and he was welcome to leave our meeting. Murmuring is a coward's way. It's a carnal way. It's a deadly way. It shows poor character to murmur, to whisper. If it needs said, say it. And if it doesn't, shut up. I need a mirror. Don't murmur. God is not well pleased. Go read Numbers chapter 14, verses 26 through 35, and also read Jude, verses 15 and 16. Also, note there in verse 10, murmurers are destroyed by the destroyers. The tempters, those who spoke openly and brazenly, were destroyed by nature. They were destroyed by the serpent. 
the idolaters and fornicators were destroyed by divine decree, by God. The judgment then, was some was meted out by God, some was meted out by nature, and some was meted out by self. We'll skip through some of this, but there's something about the sin of murmuring that rots a person. They murmur, they whisper, they're snide, they're sneaky, they say it as they turn away. And all the time we're letting that root of sin go deeper and deeper and deeper into our soul. And by our own self, we're being destroyed. This action is a slow death. It eats like a cancer, but it eats thoroughly until one is consumed with hate and contempt. They're proud, they're haughty, and they murmur. And God is not well pleased. Verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. That's us. All this is now to be used for our good. God has allowed these ugly verses of Scripture and portion of history to be recorded to remind us what can happen. We all start out the same. How we're going to end up is our choice. And now verse 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Not one person here has made it. Not I, not you, not the board, not the Sunday school teachers, or the Sunday school superintendent. It is still possible for any one of us to fall victim to sin, to lose out, and to displease God. Any of us have the, the possibility of losing out. We may begin to long for things that God has forbidden of us. We may choose to put other things before God. We may let our natural desires get us into trouble. We may say things and tempt and grieve God, or we may start murmuring and whispering. In essence, each of us has the capability of falling, of losing out, and missing heaven. We've all started well, all of us, but we all may end differently. Some well, and some not. And so that concludes the introduction of the message. The message now is in verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Today, I want to inform you that we can make it. We can end well. God has provided a way. His mercy, His grace, we do not have to lose out. We can live pure, clean, holy, surrendered to Him without fear of falling, without fear of failing, always minding God. The danger is there. Absolutely it's there. But there's also a way of escape. So whatever you're going through today, whatever the temptations you're, you're experiencing, whatever you're prone to, remember, you can make it. Don't quit. Don't fall for Satan's lies. Because there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you can bear it. We can make it. So let's stand.